Listeners, I'm here today with Jeff Ott from Beekeeping Today podcast, and I'm going to ask Jeff an off-the-cuff question. Jeff, when you work your bees, do you wear gloves? Why'd you have to put me on the spot like that, Jim? It really, <laughs> it really depends on my mood for the day and uh, what I'm doing with the bees. That makes sense. That makes sense. I'm curious because we, we spoke, Kim and I talked in May about memorable things in our lifetime that really stands out. But in general, if we're just going through the day-to-day routine actions of working bees, that's that's more useful equipment than the standout stings. Have you got a while to talk about stinging, how to deal with it, how to learn to live with it, if you can, <laughs> and other ways to suppress it? Can you talk for a while about that? Sure, I'm happy to embarrass myself, Jim. <laughs> okay. Well, I'll be embarrassing myself, too. So misery loves company, as you know. (laughs) I'm Jim Tew. And I'm Jeff Ott from Beekeeping Today Podcast. And we're coming to you on Honey Bee Obscura, where today we want to talk about the real-world situations of stinging honeybees and what to do about them, if anything. You are listening to Honey Bee Obscura, brought to you by Growing Planet Media, the folks behind Beekeeping Today Podcast. Each week on Honey Bee Obscura, hosts Kim Flottam and Jim Tu explore the complexities, the beauty, the fun, and the challenges of managing honeybees in today's world. Get ready for an engaging discussion to delight and inform all beekeepers. If you're a long timer or just starting out, sit back and enjoy the next several minutes as Kim and Jim explore all things honeybees. I remember Jeff. As a kid, stings from wasp and yellow jackets mm-hmm. and whatever. It was a even as a child, it was a big day, big event. <laughs> and my grandmother would mix up some kind of poultice with vinegar or something. And as I look back on it, all she was doing was just helping me get through the psychological shock of the fact that I had just been attacked by some other animal. And a chamomile lotion, bactine. Yeah, that all yes, comes yes. to mind. <laughs> Would you think that people who don't keep bees don't keep bees because they sting? What's, what would be the limiting factor? How restrictive is stinging to the growth of beekeeping as a universal endeavor? I would have to believe that primarily if someone was not averse to working with insects, because some people have the eek factor of working with insects, once you get past that, I think stings would be the predominant issue. Well, that's a good point. That's a good point. I've done this too long. I didn't think about the icky factor. I thought it'd be straight stings, that if bees didn't sting, everybody would love beekeeping and everybody would be one. And then all of us who think we're special would not be special at all. When I've asked audiences, if I could, if I developed a bee that did not sting, would you want it? Would you like it? Would you use that queen stock? And you know the answer because you know beekeepers as well as I do. Nope. They thought stinging was the right thing for bees to do. (laughs) That stinging was the spice of beekeeping. (laughs) I know a bunch of bears that would love to have uh, stingless bees and some (laughs) possums and some skunks. (laughs) That's an excellent point. (laughs) So I guess in general, stinging's here to stay. So what, what do you say to someone who's just starting out? How do, you, how do you deal with someone that asks you a question at the grocery store or while you're sitting beside someone in the doctor's waiting office? Don't you ever get stung? Yeah. How do you answer that question without looking like you like pain? <laughs> and you say, yeah, and I like going to the dentist, too. Um, <laughs> You know, it's it's uh, no offense to all my dentist friends. Uh, <laughs> yeah, boy, yeah, yeah. You say, yeah, you get stung, and 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 uh, then I qu- usually follow it up with, and I don't like it, so I do everything I can not to get stung, and still work the bees responsibly. When I've had those conversations with people, it, I've evolved through the years. At first, I tried to explain it. Well, you've got protective gear. Well, you learn 
bee biology and you keep stinging to a minimum, it doesn't happen that often. Yes, it always hurts, but no, the pain is not inconsolable. Mm -hmm. But then even that didn't make complete sense. And if there's even a chance of pain, why do it? That there's things that people do all the time that, that yep. has an element of potential pain to it. But that mm-hmm. doesn't mean that you don't do it. Right. So by now, the person's been called to go back to the dentist or the flight's taking off or whatever. And the conversation usually dies down there. But I guess I wanted to spend a little bit of time about these conversations that you try to explain to people that, yes, I get stung occasionally. And yes, it hurts. And no, I don't like it, but I'm going to always keep bees. I try to, I try to make that make sense in a way to someone who sees it as completely nonsensical. Along those lines, and, and this conversation often comes up on a, in a one-to-one basis with beekeepers, especially the first-year beekeepers or maybe the second-year beekeepers, when they ask, well, how do you get used to getting stung? How can I get used to working with bees and not be so fearful of being stung that I'm clumsier. Yep. Yep. Can I use, may I use the word tolerate? I don't know that I ever really get used to stinging. I, I know it. I know what it feels like. I know that some stings will take you to your knees while other stings are inconsequential, probably a factor of the amount of bee venom that the bee administered when she was able to sting you. Mm Mm-hmm. So I know all that, but that doesn't that doesn't mean that it really hurts. There is a second, Jeff, when right after a good sting, on you know, on some tender spot it is just really hurting. And just for a second, you think, just give me twenty seconds here, give me a half a minute, and I'll be okay. But right now, this really <laughs> is hurting for just a bit, and then it. It quickly passes, and then you go up. You go about your business. How does someone learn that? Yeah, wouldn't you think? Here we are, Jeff. Me anyway. I can't speak for you. Totally out of any area of expertise that I have. But wouldn't you think that a person's ability to experience and tolerate pain and adapt to it is an individual thing? Some people just pick it up like a piece of candy. Others. May never get used to it. Yes, I I, I think so, and and I think in part it is uh, a person a person who's decided to keep bees already has crossed the first threshold. They know they're going to get stung at some point, so they have they've crossed that first threshold. And the second threshold is <laughs> how many can I take before I can no longer take it? Right. That's so, right. And, and right. whether that be in a day or in a season or during the experience of the hobby. Yep. You know, can, can I get through the first Hard. season and manage the stings and still like the hobby that I think I will like? Good point. Good point. So what you're saying is that it's the stings per unit of time. <laughs> yeah. How many stings per unit of time should I grow to tolerate? And where? And where, right. So stings around my eyes are not funny, Mm -mm. and stings on the back of my arm are annoying and will cause me to jump around for a bit and deal with that, but they're not the same. Right. Right. Let's take a short break and hear from our sponsor at this point and gather our thoughts together. It's summertime, and the Varroa population in your hives is booming. Target Varroa now with Apple Life Var to protect your hives from mite-borne diseases down the road. With over 30 years of international use, Apple Life Var is a natural, thymol-based treatment with an effectiveness that exceeds 94%. Learn more and get yours from Better Bee today by visiting betterbee.com forward slash ALV. I always recommend, I always suggest, I always encourage anyone who goes into a bee yard to have on some kind of eye protection. If a visitor goes with me to a bee yard and they're confident, they're not beekeepers, but they're, they're not panicky, I still would like for them to have eye protection. Mm -hmm. I don't know anyone who's ever been stung in the eye personally. I had a student an international student who went back to his home country 
and was stung in his eye. In the actual eyeball. Had, yes, and mm-hmm. had residual problems from it. I would recovered, so. but it was not a happy situation. And I, I want, from personal experience, Jeff, I want those glasses to fit close to your head, to hold your head. I don't want it just to be a typical pair of glasses, even though I like those better than having nothing on. Because on one occasion, I had a bee hit me just above my eyebrow and then drop down behind my glasses. Mm. And then it was between my glasses, trapped there, and my eye. By the way, I'll end that story. It took me about an hour to find those glasses because they went flying. (laughs) I took those things off my face right now. But I was strongly... This is not a lecture. This is not an educational format. This is a conversational format. But I really would encourage people to have on some kind of eyeglass Mm -hmm. protection. This is a usual scenario. I'm just going to take a quick peek. I don't want to light a smoker. I don't want to get out of veil. But I do wonder if those bees are in that top super. I'm just going to have a quick look. And you think that you can just crack that top open, have a quick look, sate your curiosity. And at that moment, that bee is out. One of them comes right for you and pops you in a tender eyelid spot or whatever. So those are the moments you have to fight. Those are the moments that you have to be aware that I'm taking a risk now of agitating, upsetting, invading these bees without any protective gear myself. Well, a lot of that really depends on reading the colony and the day, right? So you don't want to do that on a cloudy, stormy cold day with nothing in bloom. I mean, I I know I don't. But if you're going to take that risk, if it's a nice blue sky, 70 degrees, all sorts of flowers in bloom, and the bees are half, – uh, half the bees are out of the colony foraging, then, then that's a different proposition. The ones that One. are left inside are busy yep. – busy and they're not going to really notice you but if it's a if it's a august and you crack that hive and 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 you just checking it out and you know, chances are you're going to get some visitors isn't that isn't that a good point just just a beautiful point a, a hive in may and june during a good flow mm-hmm. will have a completely different personality and hot on a hot august day and a bit of a dearth. The mm-hmm. Same colony that you could sit beside and watch pollen collectors come in, watch house cleaning going on. You take that same chair in August, and you're going to be running around your bee yard there in most cases because the colony is in a completely different mindset, in a completely different defensive mode. And, and, and that's absolutely true. And, and that's one of the things that drove me crazy or even – even still today somewhat is and and nothing against the YouTube beekeepers because there's many great ones out there that I enjoy watching. But early on used to see the videos without explanation of someone opening a hive in their shorts and barefoot or they're they're just opening a hive and working bees with no protective clothing. And then the first year beekeeper or someone considering the hobby says, well look, they've got they've become so gentle now that I can even go out there and 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 shorts and work the bees just like this person was doing on 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 the the video when the reality is you know the person who was did the video knew exactly the temperament of the bees at the time that they produced that video and you go back any other day they wouldn't be doing that if you went back to that hive in August they would not be out there in shorts and no veil and uh, so that's that's that always drives me crazy because that that instills in a young or a new beekeeper the the concern that if they go to their hive wearing their veil and or gloves they're going to be perceived as being a lesser beekeeper because they prefer to be protected and and so you get this um conflict with beekeepers that, well, to be a beekeeper, I need to be, you know, fearless and I need to be able to work the bees without gloves. And I to be a cool, to be a cool beekeeper, to be an in-crowd beekeeper. Yeah, to be a master, 
master beekeeper. I have to work my bees without gloves. And and there, there are instances where you have to, you will want to have the dexterity of not wearing gloves or big leather gloves and gauntlets to work your bees, but it's not necessary to enjoy the, the hobby. Well, I was going to keep up. You made four or five Sorry. good points <laughs> right in an order there. I, I was trying to memorize them, and now I, now I can recall <laughs> none of them. But they were all good points. Boom, boom, boom. But in reality, you're better off to go into the bee yard overdressed than you are to go into the bee yard underdressed and then scurry back to your truck and a cloud of bees and try to get your veil on then. But you look so much cooler, so much neater, so much in control of your destiny, strolling up to a bee colony with a veil loosely over your head and shorts and a short sleeve shirt on, only to find out that it's not a good day. And by the time you find that out, you've been stung a few times. Mm -hmm. You've impressed all the friends and neighbors standing around. But I do not practice what I preach. I mean, if when I finish this conversation with you, I'll probably walk back to my bees. I'm not going to put on a bee veil. I'm not going to do anything with them, but it's a good time to be stung. <laughs> if you go back there and stand around and you're looking at the bees, watching them fly, it's really a good time to get a bee crashing into your ear, dropping down behind your glasses. So, yes, Jim, you should do it too. You should put on equipment when you go back there. But I, I probably won't. But you're better off especially for beekeepers in public, beekeepers in a crowd, beekeepers at a meeting, at an open hive demonstration, mm, put on too much. And then as the event progresses, if it looks like it's okay, then do a slow strip yeah. and take off the gloves if you don't need them. I, I just know, <laughs> look at the clock, I know we need to wrap up. And you <laughs> asked me originally a question about what, you know, do I wear, uh, what protective clothing I wear. And I, this is how I do it, Jim. I, I like to wear a, a, a top coat or a coat, a smock, right? Because right. I, I, have, I, like have to, suit. I like to keep my clothes relatively clean. I don't want to go in the house and track honey, propolis, yep. and smoke smell around the house. And I don't want to be change, changing out clothes all the time. So it's a lot easier for me to throw on a coat with a veil and go out in the bee yard because then everything's kind of self-contained in that coat. The, the veil, I always wear a veil. I don't like to be stung in the face. Uh, the question I always have is making sure it's secure. So sometimes there have been a time or two where <laughs> I've been yep. working the bees and I for forgot that I hadn't zipped it up. And and this is what I've done for gloves. I I'm one of I'm I'm one of those weird people. I I don't I wear gloves when I wash dishes. I just like to have my hands clean. I don't know. Maybe that's come from playing guitar, or maybe that's just w weirdness. But I like to have my hands clean. So I. Typically, um, if I'm doing a lot of moving and of supers and, and pulling off of supers and moving high bodies, I'll wear gloves just to keep the stickiness down. <laughs> but if I'm going inside, if I'm looking for eggs, if I'm looking for um, uh, the queen, if I'm doing delicate procedures, then I will go without gloves. And, and if, if that's a day that I'm not feeling particularly confident, and and I'm like saying, I'm thinking, eh, I really don't get want to get stung between the fingers today or under the fingernail. I will wear, I'll put on uh, the blue uh, exam gloves because that gives me the dexterity of feeling as I used to as a paramedic, be able to start IVs and everything. That gives me all the touch, tactical feeling I need uh, to perform anything in beekeeping uh, and still have a little bit of protection should I, I irritate a bee or accidentally uh, um, grab one when I'm lifting a frame. So that's that's what I can offer. Just you can well, ease that's, into that's it. Nicely said. Nicely said. I, I I really can't argue. I always have gloves somewhere nearby. I may or may not have them on, mm -hmm. regardless of what I've said earlier. I don't put them on first and then take them off. I usually think, oh, wow, I've had some number of stings here. It usually doesn't take a lot, five or six or ten stings. I think enough of this. I'm going to put gloves on. So maybe I'll change my mind. So it's like a sliding scale for me. What, what do you need? What's the event? What's the workload? I do readily support what you said. 
that most of the time I'm wearing gloves as a work glove, not as right. a bee glove. Right. With sticky honey and heavy supers and little nail head sticking out of a box somewhere. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> so I, th I think we're in agreement. We right. understand that if we keep bees, we're going to be stung. Right. And the question is, how many stings can each individual take on a particular day in a particular episode before they've had enough? We didn't mention the commercial world. We don't have time for it. I probably don't have the qualifications for it, but all my commercial experience has been you put gloves on i mean you're getting paid to do the job we got to work all these bees we got to be back home we've got these obligations made we don't have time to run back and forth to the truck to put gloves on or take gloves off so you go suited up ready to go end of statement when, when i work construction uh, the foreman uh, i was helping build frame houses in colorado and the foreman would always he would say you know you take you take those splinters out on your time. Don't take them out in my time. <laughs> and he was serious. That's interesting. He's holding a hammer. <laughs> he was serious. Uh, well, if you're new to beekeeping, it'll come. It is not an easy thing. You, it doesn't come quickly. Just be patient with it. Do whatever it takes to evolve and grow. Yeah. If it's yeah. important to you not to wear gloves, then work toward that that goal. If it's not important to you to, that you're gloveless, then keep them on. I mean, don't, right. don't worry about what other beekeepers think about you. Be the best beekeeper you can based on your standards would be my thought. Here, here. Well, thank you for letting me dwell on this again. I, we, Kim and I talked about standout stings. We didn't talk about just day-to-day -day dealing with it, growing with it, thing you and I chatted with here. I always enjoy talking to you, buddy. Enjoy being here. Thank you, Jim. All right. Bye-bye.